Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Mani Parke. I am an engineer at Databricks working on MLflow. So to, uh, I'm here to talk to you all about what is MLflow, uh, the motivation behind building uh, this machine learning framework, uh, uh, what the co components of MLflow looks like, and where we're going to take this. So I'm going to introduce uh, all of this in the next 15 minutes or so uh, as a preamble to Zach's presentation. So uh, anybody, uh, I'm sure this team appreciates how complex MLflow development is, and also appreciates that it's a slightly harder than traditional software development as we have done in the last few decades. Um, sort of to tease this out a little bit, uh, I want to sort of talk about some differences between traditional software development and machine learning uh, development. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, problems in each. So let's say you take a problem in traditional software. Let's say you're building a credit card transaction system or a functional verification system or any of that. You start with a, fun uh, uh, with a functional specification. You know exactly the terms and conditions and what product you're trying to build. So the goal is pretty clear what you want to do. In machine learning, the goal is to optimize the metric. So there is no perfect answer. You're just trying to get better and better. The metric could be increasing accuracy, or it could be a vector of different metrics that you're trying to optimize. All right. Uh, the other difference is quality. Uh, in traditional software, the when you're trying to solve problem, the quality of the product eventual depends primarily on the code, which includes obviously the unit tests that you write and integration tests, but primarily the code that you have written, uh, that, that uh, engineers write uh, and, and test, uh, and, and yeah, to some level on the system. Uh, uh, so that, that's pretty contained of a problem. Uh, when we go to machine learning, uh, there's not only all the code and the system, but also the data that we use for training the models, and then how how well the model is tuned, and how we like uh, uh, regularly continue to update with fresh data, and we have to tune the models, use different algorithms, uh, and and so on and so forth. So the quality is sort of a shifting goal and a moving target, uh, just like the uh, the goal that we talked about. And the third thing I want to talk about is in traditional software, you develop off of a common software stack, uh, something that the team is flex uh, is, is, has worked with in the past, uh, released different projects on. Uh, you're pretty well acquainted. Uh, machine learning, on the other hand, uh, you want to constantly experiment with new libraries that constantly come, keep coming out, different frameworks, new algorithms, various different types of models. Uh, and not only that, uh, other than experimenting, you must know how to productionalize them. Uh, so just having a model uh, that is built with this new framework is not good enough. You need to know how to productionalize it and put it into uh, in, in a serving uh, fashion in your existing framework. So that sort of becomes hard. Um, let's look at the same thing slightly differently from the machine learning life cycle and how all of this presents challenges. A typical machine learning life cycle always starts with taking in raw logs of some format and then they're, they're ETL'd and cleansed and then you featureize them to get some feature vectors. Uh, and then you train it using different uh, training algorithms, serve it, and then monitor how the serving looks like. Uh, and this looks simple enough, but it's not uh, because eventually there are these backward loops. For instance, uh, after you sort of train your model, you realize that, oh, okay, the feature vectors were not perfect, so I need to go back and redo those or uh, you might have to retrain with another algorithm. Uh, or if, if the model looks good, it's productionizing the, the, the production logs, it's gonna create even more data that you might want to bring back into the loop and retrain, with, uh, retrain for the next iteration of this model. Uh, so by itself, even if this looks uh, like a straightforward loop, it's, it, it, has, it has its own iterative loops built in. Now let's say you go ahead and try and implement each of these steps in uh, as a machine learning lifecycle. 
you'd realize that there is, is a zoo of ecosystem of frameworks for each of this. Uh, your logs could be coming in from Kafka and you may be using Spark to do all the all the heavy hitting and cleaning of data uh, featureizing. And then there is like every, there is TensorFlow, uh, traditional, uh, traditional machine learning algorithms like scikit-learn and, and so on and so forth to train the data. And then you have all of these different frameworks where you can deploy that. So using all of this can sort of present all its challenges. And typically for machine learning practitioners, uh, it is incentivized to use different, uh, different algorithms and different frameworks in order to best receive, uh, to get the best quality that we've been talking about for your model. So uh, if, if optimizing metrics is the goal, then you pretty much end up trying out various different tools. And to add to that, uh, uh, just being able to train and create a model is not sufficient. Uh, we all know that using the right parameters for tuning is a quintessential to getting the right model. It can make all the difference between like, you know, just guesswork uh, versus using the right set of parameters to get like the ideal results that you've been looking for for uh, development of the product. Uh, and, and beyond that, as you talked about, deploying of these models and managing the life cycle of each of these models becomes a challenge in itself. Now, to add to that, if we sort of add to the next layer, uh, as the team starts growing bigger, as the amount of data uh, gets larger, scale adds up. And you end up having to deal with, uh, with various different people and different teams uh, t uh, owning different components of this life cycle. So you may have a team working on, on, on a team of data engineers working on the ETL and uh, logs part of it and a set of uh, data scientists working on the training uh, aspect and, and a set of system engineers on the deployment part of it. So you have to sort of work through the life cycle of a model, how it passes through these different teams and uh, governance of it all. Uh, and then finally, uh, building a model and, and putting it in production is, uh, is, is one side of the problem, working with the rest of your uh, product, whether it is a fraud detection system or ad click tracking. Uh, you want to be able to use other systems in your ecosystem that work along with your machine learning models. For example, you may want to A-B test different style of models, or you may want to sort of track uh, how these experiments are flowing through different life cycles of the user or you want to sort of have a more automated, orchestrated way of training these models and managing lifestyle. And finally, you have to start worrying about how the models drift from the expected quality and, and data drift and so on and so forth. So this in itself, uh, what we have seen is an extremely complex process. There is not a single tool out there that makes it easy to use. And in fact, you have to end up using multiple tools uh, that you and the team are comfortable with, right? So as we start looking at this, uh, uh, when we built MLflow as an open platform to be able to, for users to manage their models and machine learning frameworks, we wanted it such that it works with all of these existing tools, makes it easier, uh, to work across the stack uh, of these of various tools and not necessarily be, be one of these tools, but, then, but work with a lot of these tools to solve the problems that have not been solved. So going over to stuff, if I have to talk about what is MLflow in a quick three bullet slide. Uh, so MLflow is an open platform that helps you manage your machine learning development lifecycle and it does it in three ways. One, uh, we have lightweight API to be able to work with any ML uh, library. Uh, so as we talked about, as like everybody has their favorite library to use, or in fact, you want to try out different libraries. They could be in different programming languages. Uh, the key aspect that we saw here was data scientists and machine learning practitioners don't want to get locked in to one particular library or one particular language. You want to sort of be able to use any kind of language. Uh, so th that's where we built uh, MLflow as an API first approach. So you can talk to MLflow as, as uh, components using REST API or Python, Java, and uh, uh, and R, uh, they all built up on this basic REST API and lets you interact with MLflow. Uh, the second thing we wanted to do is 
uh, we wanted to make it uh, make reproducibility of the runs a primary. Uh, so, for instance, you have uh, you typically train your model on your local machine, and then you want to sort of make sure that it reproduces the exact same results when you're running it on a cloud somewhere, any kind of cloud platform. Uh, what makes it hard is getting get that reproducibility in. If you if you send your code to some other engineer on your team, they should be able to do it the exact same way. So having the having your and the sessions run the exact same way on any cloud was one of the other development principles, or key principles behind building MLflow. And then finally, simplicity and ease of wrapping up was uh, the other goal, such that it should be useful for one engineer on an org, but also easy to scale up to 1,000 people org. So uh, the scale and ease of use was also sort of thought in when we sort of designed that. Okay. Uh, so from here, uh, the MLflow supports like three different components uh, to begin with. One uh, is uh, the uh, MLflow tracking server. We're going to spend some time talking about that. Uh, it's necessarily a centralized repository to store all the critical information uh, that is uh, that is generated from and required to generate your machine learning run. And this could be like you know, the parameters and configs and, and, and also the metrics that come out, right? So that's that. And then it has mechanisms to query that. So it's like a, 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 like a database for all your machine learning runs. The second one, uh, MLflow projects, is a, a code packaging format. And uh, that is uh, targeted towards making your runs reproducible when you run it uh, on any cloud platform or uh, at any point of time later uh, later on. So this is a, a way to sort of store everything such that you can guarantee that you are reproducing that runs and anywhere and anybody else can do it as well. And the third one is uh, uh, ML, ML models is a generic uh, format, a packaging format for models such that the models that are, are once written out by ML flow can be deployed across a variety of production platforms. Uh, may it be, <clears throat> excuse me, may it be in real time scoring format, or it could be like batch scoring or, or streaming platforms. So that's, that's the three big components. And then I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about each one of these. Uh, so let's jump right into the key concept of tracking, uh, ML for tracking. Uh, we, we, we talked about uh, tuning machine learning uh, uh, your, your algorithm. So parameters, which could be like a numeric or, or string parameters, are, are key to sort of making sure you get what you want out of your machine learning run. Data scientists uh, sort of try out thousands of experiments with the same algorithm to sort of get the right, uh, right, uh, get the right uh, results that they are looking for. So uh, one of the key concepts is a dictionary of parameters that might be associated with your particular run. Uh, another thing is after your run is done, you, you generate numeric values uh, by scoring your uh, on a test data. So what are the metrics, like accuracy, error, so on and so forth? That becomes a key concept that the tracking server might want to, uh, the engineer might want to keep track of uh, in this consolidated repo. And then finally, if you start looking at your models, uh, uh, the model generated from your track training run uh, could be itself an artifact that you might want to store away to keep track or governance uh, or even use it for, uh, for scoring later on. Uh, along with that, you want to keep track of uh, metadata around your, uh, around uh, what was uh, metadata around how the model was scored, what source code was used, uh, the exact version, maybe a Git uh, ID, uh, a Git hash. Uh, uh, these are some of the interesting things you may want to store around along with your training data. And then finally, there could be some text that you might want to store, uh, some uh, a document that uh, might want to capture the details of uh, your model. And for that, we have this high-level tag or notes that uh, that you can record for your training run. And then at the bottom right, you see a UI that sort of shows how it would show up. 
on an MLflow UI. Uh, this is the query layer that uh, I was referring to where you have an ability to show all your runs uh, and then uh, using this uh, a SQL-like syntax query that run uh, for metrics and parameters and sort of uh, slice and dice your data based uh, on uh, specific metrics. For example, you can say metrics.accuracy is greater than 0.98 or so on and so forth. Okay, so how do people use this uh, consolidated uh, storage? So, uh, uh, your yeah, MLflow tracking server, as I said, is a database, and you could have various people writing to this database uh, for each training run, either through some hosted notebooks or a local app running on your machine or a cloud job, right? So, they're writing to this uh, centralized database through REST API or Python API, uh, and, and that's how they're storing, as, as we'll see how it is done. And then you, uh, we have built a UI layer, and then there is an API layer to be able to query that database. So in this picture, we sort of uh, abstracted away the database. Uh, we started off when we uh, in, uh, opened up, uh, when we uh, released MLflow, uh, using a file-backed store. And now we have various different uh, stores. Uh, we'll soon be releasing a SQL-based store to sort of store all the metadata around runs. And, and so you can query that using, again, as a, a UI that we've built or uh, using Python API. All right. Uh, now, finally, how does this look like? The lightweight API I was talking about, uh, it starts off with very simple, you start a run and then uh, you, uh, you can record the parameters that are, are super important for the particular run and you can see that uh, highlighted in green here. Uh, and then you can paste in your training algorithm and at the end of it, you, uh, you, you compute some metric based on some test data and you can log that metric, or you can actually uh, log the artifact or some higher level, uh, artif uh, you can log the model or some high level artifact, like for instance, a plot of some metric data, and that can be logged as well. And then we, you, in this particular example, the model happens to be a TensorFlow graph. So we are logging it like a TensorFlow graph. So MLflow has these uh, packages within it to understand that, hey, this is a TensorFlow graph, I'm gonna write it as a model. So any kind of tool that understands the TensorFlow uh, graph can use that for deployment. So with very simple API that surrounds your existing uh, training algorithm, you can, uh, you can now very easily use a tracking server and whatever happens during this run gets logged to the tracking server. All right, so that was uh, uh, tracking. Now let's talk about projects. Uh, now, as a reminder, this is again a mechanism, uh, a code, a packaging mechanism to make it easy for you or anybody on your team to reproduce your runs on any cloud platform anytime later. So, uh, what are the things that we need to be able to do that? So, uh, in this packaging format, we obviously need to include the code that is needed for training. Uh, you may also need some configs and some pointer to data. So this effectively uh, constitutes uh, what would be needed to be able to reproduce the run, whether it is running it locally on your or somebody else's uh, local machine or running it on some uh, remote uh, cloud. But then how exactly does this packaging format look like? So here's an example. It's necessarily a directory structure where uh, you have this file called ML project. And if you look at the file, here's an example of a very small version of the file. It right at the bat tells you that it needs a Conda environment, right? So this is a Conda environment that the data scientists use to train their model. And the Conda is a YAML file that is included within that directory structure. And then if you look at the next thing, it talks about one entry point, uh, a main entry point for uh, being able to run this project. And it says that, okay, you need these parameters, which is uh, a path for the training data uh, and a, a, a float parameter called lambda. Uh, and it's here it's uh, defined as a default value of 0.1. Uh, and then uh, how does uh, MLflow know what to do when it sees that entry point? It says, okay, it runs a very simple Python command called main.py and it gives it the uh, training data in lambda. And obviously this is the code uh, main.py and then there could be other dependent uh, modules included. Uh, that this is the code that you have written 
to create your training run. So very simply, uh, when you write a training uh, algorithm, you include this within that directory structure, create a simple ML project file, and uh, capture your Conda environment, and boom, anybody uh, is able to then reproduce your run using a simple couple of ML flow commands that can just take your existing code, use their data, use their parameters, and, re and, and create a run, or you can reproduce your run. So how does somebody do that? Uh, through a command line, ML flow, uh, space run, space, a GitHub repo, or it can be a link to this local directory structure. If you want to do this programmatically, uh, there is a mlflow.run, a Python command to do, do that. Uh, uh, so uh, with a bunch of uh, uh, with a bunch of cluster specifications, you can run this on a cluster as well. So very simply, uh, you can sort of do all your local training, package it up in this format along with a Conda environment, and then you're set to go uh, to uh, to run this on the cloud. And then finally, to talk about models. Uh, models again was a format that once you write out a model using MLflow models, it should make it easy for you to uh, uh, to deploy this on any kind of an environment that can host that model. So for let's take an example where <coughs> excuse me, where you have created a model and it could be like a, a tensor flow graph a model that uh, uh, in in your local environment. And then you want to write it out in such a format that it can be, it can be loaded on, let's say, uh, Amazon SageMaker, and then also in some kind of environment that runs Python. Uh, so this would be a way of saying that the same model uh, that is used by one team for, let's say, batch scoring is also used by another team for some real-time scoring. And it uses the same model that is being written by MLflow. So how does this look like? Again, this is a packaging format. The, the format will be very similar to what you've seen in projects. It is an ML model file, and it has a few things. First, it tells you a few metadata about when this model was created, what was the run, and then it says, that, okay, here we have this model written out in two different flavors. One is a TensorFlow flavor. It's a dictionary of things <coughs> that any environment that excuse me, that can run a TensorFlow format would need to be able to uh, deserialize this model and make it executable. And then any environment that uses Python uh, can use this ML flow mo module called mlflow.tensorflow to be able to then load this model mo module and then execute it like, like it would with any Python function. Again, it all depends on making sure that all the, uh, the dependencies are in play. Uh, so now if you have a team of data scientists, all they need to know is how to, uh, how to load or run their own uh, training and um, uh, package the model using the MLflow uh, commands. And then at the end of it, you could have another set of uh, system engineers who can easily take these MLflow written models and deploy it onto any framework that makes sense. So MLflow becomes that central place where users can uh, use to sort of create various different deployment frameworks, deploy to those, write it and all that. Okay, so how can you learn about a little aspect? So this was a little flavor of how MLflow looks like. Uh, there is a lot more in terms of documentation and, uh, and training examples. If you want to do some hyperparameter tuning, multi-step workflows uh, for, for REST and batch scoring. Uh, you can start off with installing uh, MLflow through PyPy, or you can download it through the uh, GitHub repo and, and try it out. So uh, the, the, point, uh, the key point to go to would be mlflow.org that hosts a website and has uh, all the examples. Okay, uh, in the last few minutes, I want to just talk about uh, the open source community growth and how uh, MLflow that started off about eight months back has uh, has been well appreciated and, uh, and, and embraced by community. Uh, so uh, this is a quick, uh, I wanted to use four metrics to sort of show that. It, it, it started eight months ago when it was released during uh, a Spark plus AI Summit in June. And since then, we have 77 code contributors from 40 different companies that have contributed to it. And here's a quick plot that shows about the number of contributor growth uh, 
over, over months as compared to a couple of other favorite open source projects. And across, uh, and this, this is a great chart, chart that shows how, how quickly people have, have started using it and, and, and actually writing code and contributing different things. Uh, uh, another uh, metric that uh, is amazing is about uh, 420,000 monthly downloads on PyPy. Again, a comparison with some of the other favorite tools that people use. So this is about, uh, this, is, this is great growth in the last eight months or so. Uh, we have a San Francisco Bay Area meet, uh, MLflow meetup. We have about 718 members, and here are some pictures of uh, one of the latest meetups that we had uh, here at Databricks office, uh, and, and some uh, uh, folks from our customers and other people showing uh, how they've used MLflow and, uh, in, that, uh, in, in their workflows. And then uh, finally, we recently had a survey on MLflow.org website, and uh, 30 orgs want to publicly list themselves as users of MLflow. Uh, and I want to sort of state that this uh, survey is still open. Uh, and uh, I invite everybody to go look at mlflow.org and there's a Google, server, Google form for the survey. We want to know uh, if you have used MLflow and if you, if you have not, uh, what sort of things are you looking forward to in that. I want to know more about what, what, what makes uh, what, are, what are the requirements that, that you're looking for and what would make it easy for you to use uh, MLflow? Um, so uh, at a very high level, uh, some of the large contributions to MLflow came from external orgs. Uh, uh, to, uh, it could be system-related things like Git integration and cloud support or uh, UI level of work uh, to visualize experiments uh, and, and integration with different packages. A lot of uh, a lot of contributions came from external uh, contributors, uh, and these are some of the big ones. Uh, and, and there's way more than this. Uh, this slide is slightly dated. Uh, in the last few minutes, I wanted to start, talk about roadmaps and where we are sort of going from here. Uh, as I mentioned that we had this survey, uh, one of the things in this survey was how have you been using MLflow and what would you like to see more? So one of the things that we heard was that we wanted to, uh, that uh, users had a lot of requirements for existing MLflow components. Uh, to name a few, uh, currently we are at version 0 0.83. Uh, and we want to sort of, uh, as we start going to 0.9 and, uh, and 1.0, we're sort of thinking of adding, in 0.9 we'll be adding a SQL backed uh, store for tracking server. This is one of the most uh, frequently asked requests. Uh, and then we're adding Fluent Java and Scala API, a, a lot of UI uh, scalability uh, 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 enhancements, and, and then uh, more on the logging side of things. For projects, we talked about Conda being used to reproduce your runs. Uh, there has been a lot of ask for Docker-based project environments. And, and then uh, finally, I want to mention in MLflow models, uh, a, a lot of requests came around that, okay, I want to use a model, I want to save it, and then I want to sort of ha inject some custom code. It could be sort of a querying form of feature store, or it could be like, you know, transforming some features a little bit. So, uh, the sort of custom logging and, and custom code uh, is something that is being worked on actively and we'll start releasing it in 0.9 and 1.0. Uh, uh, this is some of the things that are, are, are on the roadmap for the next few releases. But then we are also starting to think of some more components that we could add. For example, a model registry or, or a multi-step workflow using GUI. You can already do that using uh, the ML projects and you can have multiple entry points. But would, would, it, would it make sense to have a UI to sort of edit your multi-step multi, multi workflow? And then, uh, we're looking at adding some telemetry components, uh, logging data and metrics and taking it back into some analytics tools. So we're, sort of, we're looking for feedback around that. So again, another plug, plug for the survey on mlflow.org. We want to know how you use your mlflow uh, libraries and frameworks and how what would you like as to, for us to add as integrations in mlflow. So that's the survey. Uh, uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, I want to just sort of, uh, again, put up mlflow.org, uh, uh, join us on Slack, or there's an email uh, thread you can join. And uh, 
uh, thank you for giving me the time to talk at the summit. If anybody wants uh, uh, to, jo to come to Spark Summit, uh, here is a, a code uh, that I wanted to sort of share with you all. Uh, if, uh, uh, if, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now or, or towards the end of, uh, of the talk. Uh, also, if you want to just reach out to me, uh, I'm at Databricks. My, my name is Manny, M-A-N-I. You can reach me at Manny at Databricks or through Slack on mlflow.org. Um, thank you. Well, that's, that was great, a great overview too. Um, quick question, what is the dates for the Spark AI Summit? You. Uh, it's in April. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's April 26th. Uh, awesome. I'm sure we'll have some people there from Red Hat for sure. Um, so uh, next up, um, uh, if there's no questions, or maybe we'll save the questions for after um, Zach's demo too. Zach, if you want to take over sharing the um, the screen, we will get you set up. And um, Manny, if you can add in into the, the notes um, the link to your Bay Area meetup, too, because I think that would be of interest for folks. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Perfect. So right. can, can everybody see my screen? Absolutely, we can. Go for it. Perfect. Okay. So... So my name is Zach and uh, I wanted to give an update on some open source work that I'm working on around MLflow operator. Um, and just, just trying to share some of our use cases and motivation of why we built that. Um, so we had a requirement um, and our use case was to, to, to basically uh, find a tool um, to perform hyperparameter tuning. So you might ask, you know, uh, what what is hyperparameter tuning? Um, what what are these things called hyperparameters? Um, as Manny pointed out in, in his presentation, you know, uh, when when we're creating machine learning models, we'll be, you know, uh, we'll, we may want to do some hyperparameter tuning, right? So when, we, when we're creating ML models, you'll be presented with different ways on how to define your model architecture. In the beginning, you don't know uh, what the, what, you don't know what the optimal uh, architecture should, should look like for your model. Um, you, you would need to do uh, multiple runs and test your, your model with multiple, uh, you know, different, um, uh, op to different uh, parameters to find the optimal uh, model architecture. So the so the parameters that we define, the the model architecture are called hyperparameters, and the process of searching uh, for the ideal model architecture is called hyperparameter tuning. So let me tie this back up to the use case here. So applying this to to our use case, uh, we, we let, let's say let's say if we have an unsupervised machine learning problem. Uh, or machine learning technique such as k-means. Um, so you might ask, what is k-means? Uh, k-means uh, uh, is, is used uh, to partition data points in k clusters. And let's suppose k is three. Let's say we have three clusters um, and we have 10 data points. What k-means does is it takes, that, uh, takes the features of the 10 data points and assigns each point to either cluster one, two, or three. Um, and the data points that are similar will be grouped under one cluster. So when we wanted to, to do uh, experiment tracking on, on uh, that particular use case, uh, we, we were sending performance metrics of our k-means cluster model, such as uh, parameters, such as the number of clusters, number of PCA dimensions, and then we were collecting uh, uh, many metrics, but the most important uh, ones for us was the inertia and the mutual information score. So that's uh, more into the the use case, uh, you know. But you know, ML lifecycle is a complex thing. Um, we wanted something off the shelf, open source that we could pull, pull in. Uh, we we're running on OpenShift, uh, which is our distribution of Kubernetes. So we wanted something that runs on OpenShift. 
to do things like this, training the model, doing hyperparameter, doing um, versioning. Uh, we found MLflow a great uh, tool to that has these all these great features and then uh, tracking experiments. So this is just a GIF. Uh, I'll show you an actual live demo of this, but we built an operator, a Kubernetes operator, um, that deploys MLflow tracking server, um, backed by S3, and stores our models, uh, and can store our models in Ceph storage. Um, I'll show you a demo today on on uh, on how you could you could experiment track track your models, parameters, and metrics and even artifacts. This is the MLflow UI. This is Ceph Nano. So just for our demo, I'm, I'm just rolling out a Ceph Nano, uh, showing you that you can store your models in S3, in Ceph. Um, so if you if, if you didn't want to store, uh, if, if, you, if you want more of a on-prem storage, Ceph is a great technology to try. So um, I wanted to keep this quick um, and, dive right into demo um so so we have openshift here um we have uh our operator here mlflow tracking operator so i've already deployed it we have one instance of the server um and we're gonna we, we have mlflow here that's already running so that one instance is there it's pointing to an s3 bucket called Zach Hassan, um, and that S3 bucket is here in Ceph Nano, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this this code here, which uh, is the, the, the standard example that's on MLflow uh, website, um, but I'll just point you to where the code lives, um, which is here. It's just a standard example where <clears throat> we're using the standard example and it's using the same MLflow APIs. It's logging the parameters, it's logging the metrics, and then it's logging, uh, storing the model into the server. And it's choosing different parameters and then we can compare these three different runs. So let's, uh, without further ado, this is our, our UI. We're gonna refresh just so there's no uh, smokes and mirrors. We can see there's no runs in there right now. So if I go ahead and, and do a run, so we already did a build of a, of that, that Git repo, we built that already, it's already here. We're gonna inject a secret, and that secret um, is, is here. Since we don't wanna store our, our, we don't wanna ask users for their AWS access key, their secret, um, we kind of want to keep it in secrets, and then these secrets would get injected into the container. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Uh, we'll call this OpenShift Commons, and let's go. OpenShift Commons container is running. One, two, three. And let's refresh here. Okay, so we have our three experiments. Let's take a look inside. Okay. We can see graphs. We can see uh, our model is stored here. We can see our dependencies here. We can see the format that uh, Manny was, was showing us. So if I wanted to go actually and, and, and maybe pull down this particular model file, I could just go to this S3 address. So I'll just search for the run ID in Ceph storage. I'll go into Ceph storage, find the run ID. Artifact, model, and this is our model here. So I could pull that down from uh, S3. Um, but going back, going back into into this uh, MLflow UI. So since I have three runs already, I want to say, let's say, I want to compare these three runs side by side. 
I can do that. And then I have a UI that I can just compare different runs. I can see, you know, uh, you know, I could uh, I could take a look at uh, different runs and whatnot. Um, I can compare different uh, different things, and I can see them side by side, right? And I can choose the one that provides the best metrics. So that's uh, that's pretty much the the quick uh, demo of running uh, an M machine learning job, tracking experiments, storing the model in S3. Um, so uh, just to wrap this up, um, what's next for this? Um, so the next thing we, we, we did was we, we created a PR in the MLflow uh, repo. Um, and like all things open source, it always starts with a PR. Um, and we have a PR in MLflow and we're contributing this, this operator to the MLflow community um, and collaborating there. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, so I'm happy to take questions. Well, that's awesome because you actually answered a couple of questions for me um, in terms of what the next steps were there. So um, in terms of getting this into the ML flow repo and, and getting it donated there, I was, I'm happy to see that. So thanks, Zach and, and Manny, for, for making that happen. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, Hema, um, if you just unmute yourself, you can ask those questions. See if you should be able to. There you go. Okay. go. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is Hema. Uh, I'm currently working with the AICOE team. Um, had a conversation with Zach as well with the different use cases for um, MLflow, particularly for the machine learning aspect. As a data scientist, I was testing and trying. Um, so I just had a couple of questions to uh, Manny. Yeah, uh, I do know that there are a lot of, like you mentioned, it was great to know that there are new versions of MLflow coming with mm -hmm. with some of the features mm -hmm. that you mentioned. And um, the only questions, uh, some of the questions I had was, um, as I was testing out MLflow, um, let's say we have like three to four data scientists who are working and testing different kind of models. One is running K-means, someone else is running um, you know, K means plus plus or some spectral clustering. Um, so when we run the MLflow server, which is a, a one server, which is shared by multiple users, uh -huh. uh, is there a way to sort of identify or if we're all pushing it under one experiment, um, is there a way to sort of parallelize this or do we all just sort of push it under one particular experiment ID or give it a name? Um, is that like something that's already supported or um, just, just wanted to know if, um, if there were any further easier ways to sort of understand what are the different people, how the different people are sort of working on the same kind of project? Yeah, that's a really good question, Hema. So I, I can answer it a couple of ways. So an experiment, if you start thinking about it, is, is your way of organizing different runs. So okay. let's say all you four or five data scientists are working on the same project and you want to sort of work off of each other's runs, you want to sort of share your data with each other and they are related to one exact problem that you're solving. Then it actually does make sense to wrap them up as one experiment. Okay. And then you all are submitting your runs to the exact same experiment and then they will be recorded uh, as different uh, different runs uh, that are because if the if you if you look at it, uh, the runs are uh, UUIDs. So uh, you can then have uh, an, an in the in the UI they will be recorded with your specific user ID as to who recorded it. So it's very easy to sort of do that. Now you mentioned a few minutes ago that everybody may be using different algorithms, and that's fine too because yeah. each algorithms may need different set of parameters. They 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 will generate different set of metrics. It might get a little harder to compare across those, but if you really need them all to be together, MFLO supports that. 
Okay. If you prefer to have them as different experiments, you can just create different experiments and, and, and store that. So for example, let's say all of you are working on some ad click tricking, uh, tracking or something like that. And you want to sort of have two different experiments for two different class of models, right? Let's say one is a deep learning model and another is a, a traditional model. You could just sort of like, you know, once you're working, uh, you're working on that project for deep, uh, with deep learning, you can record it to a deep learning experiment. If you want to do it for a traditional model, it's going to the other one. So it all depends on how you want to use it. MLflow supports all of this. Uh, as I said, it is designed to scale across a lot of users. In fact, yeah. Yeah. a lot of users that use MLflow open source ha have it uh, such that the server is running off of an EC2 instance, the data is stored on S3, and, and uh, a, a bunch of people, dozens of people in the organization are reporting the data to the same server. Oh, yeah, thank you. That, that makes sense, yeah. Cool. I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions. Um, we're almost to the top of the hour, so I, I always love it when I think I'm giving everybody 15 minutes, but you just um, blow it out of the water and, and, and use the time wisely. So um, I'm going to thank everybody for their time today. All right, then. Perfect. Thank you for, in, for the invite, Diane. I really appreciate being able to, uh, to talk about MLflow here. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have you every time, so um, we'll do it again when you have enough, another update. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. All right. Thanks, Zach, for pulling us all together. Take care. All right. Bye.